country was started, there was no income tax whatsoever. In fact, you could look at the Constitution, chapter and verse, Article 1, Section 2, and it said something very funky, very peculiar. It said that direct taxes are not possible unless it's directly apportioned. What does that mean? It means that if, let's say, Virginia has 5% of the population, they could contribute to the federal government no more than 5% of total revenue. And this was a cockamamie scheme designed to make sure that there was no sort of runaway taxation, which the colonists had just fought a war against. So as a result, for the first hundred something years of the country, there was no income tax whatsoever, and the country had to rely on tariffs and excise taxes. And you saw the first tariff was 5% on most products. And it's really funny reading about the first tariff passed in 1789, because there was a first tax loophole in US history. So the first income tax was passed into law, signed into law by Abraham Lincoln in 1862. And what you see with these early taxes, the early experimentation with an income tax, is basically no one paid it, but the pretty well off. So even by the end of the Civil War, only a little bit more than 10% of the American public paid income taxes. So the first income tax in US history was signed into law in 1862 and went away in 1873. So what happened was there was a something called the populist movement in the early 20th century. And there is kind of like soak the rich, eat the rich mentality. And this kind of culminated in 1913 with the ratification of the 16th Amendment allowing for the implementation of an income tax. Pay taxes. It's your duty to pay and know why you pay. Now at first the income tax was very, very small. And basically the only people that paid it were millionaires in today's terms. But over time, that tax liability grew and grew for more and more people. So the first and basic rate was 1%, but most people didn't even pay that basic rate because there was an exemption up to $3,000 in income, which doesn't sound like a lot now, but back then that encompassed most of the middle class. And the max rate that you could pay on your taxes back then, that first rate, was 7%. But you had to earn basically $10 million back then to qualify for that 7% rate. And if you're that rich, if you're a Carnegie Mellon of the era, you're gonna avoid those taxes in the form of a foundation. Nonetheless, the people who were primarily paying were people who had the most money, and it was a very small percentage of the US population. So what happened was the government said, you're not going to get your money anymore and then have to pay it a year later to Uncle Sam. We are just going to have employers withhold the money right away so Uncle Sam gets his due sooner. Across the nation, Americans dig way down deep for our record-breaking income tax collection. Record-breaking in every way. 50 million of us filing individual returns seven times the number of taxpayers in 1940. And as a result, there's a massive flood in revenue into the treasury. And I think what happened there is that people weren't thinking as much in terms of this is my money and Uncle Sam is taking it away. They never saw that money to begin with. The treasury itself admits that this is an advantage to having withholding, that taxpayers do not see that money to begin with. After World War II, I think people were desensitized to this idea of paying taxes because of withholding, which was introduced during the war. And if people are not taking in their money from work and then paying Uncle Sam close to a year later, if they don't see that paycheck to begin with, they're not going to care as much about taxes. Over time, the tax code became immeasurably more complex as interest groups saw the power of the federal government increasing and saw the ability to tilt the scales in their favor and get their little carve out. So in the tax code, carve outs come about when you have special interests realizing that there's some measure of the tax code that they could put in their favor through a carve out or through a break that benefits them. And the beauty of this from their perspective is most people are not even going to notice. Because let's say you have a tax break for NASCAR owners to develop their speedways. And let's say it costs two or three billion dollars. That's only five dollars per person that the American taxpayer is paying as a result of this break. Most people don't notice five dollars. But these NASCAR executives are noticing the two or three billion dollars they're getting as a result of the carve out. I think that you're seeing as a result of this ever increasing and ever complex tax code that people have to start their preparation process months in advance 
and they have to spend tens of hours a person or a household looking into how they can navigate through these complexities in the task code that most people just don't understand. And thank goodness for uh, software like TurboTax and CPAs. I mean, people are just not able to navigate this on their own. The task code is not designed to be simple. People paying those higher taxes, they're not the rich as most people think of them. They're successful people, and if you're having a successful year as a small business, you're gonna pay that, that highest tax bracket. A good year is not necessarily meaning that you're rich and you're a part of the 1%. In fact, a significant percentage of people who the left would classify as rich and successful, one percenters, they have one good year and then they have five years of, let's say, middle tax brackets or lower tax brackets. So it's not fair to say that you have this upper crust that's always just paying a lower rate. They pay a higher rate and in fact, the US has one of the most progressive tax systems in the world. Ideally, we can institute a flat tax in which everyone pays the same rate and no one's punished for working harder or being more successful. In terms of making taxes better and fairer, there is a model for reform and we saw this in the late 80s when President Reagan and Congress agreed on fundamental tax reform that eliminated deductions and carve-outs and breaks that benefited few at the expense of many and was able to channel the savings into lower rates for everyone and consolidate those brackets. Now brackets are a huge issue in the complexity of the tax code because if you're a worker or if you're an innovator or entrepreneur and you make a certain amount of money you're going to be bumped up into a higher tax bracket and you're going to be punished for that hard work and for that success so if we're able to eliminate those carve outs and deductions and funnel those savings into lowering rates for all and getting rid of most of these brackets 